Good morning. Oh, oh. Wow. Lynn, you're the man. All right. 40 years. All right. There's. <laughs> now we got Nathan. Give me, give me just a minute here to make sure. We just now got something here, Nathan. Is, is that okay? It's a little. We've got a ringing thing going on. Okay. That sounds better. You can hear me now, right? No, uh, ringing still. No. Okay, how's that? That's good. Okay, good. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Still a little ringing. There, how's that? That much better. Okay. All right, let's get going then. I think that'll work. Hey, good morning. morning. We're so glad you are here. I want to thank you so much for being here. Beautiful August morning here in lovely, wonderful, sun, fun, stay, play, Bakersfield. Yes, who remembers that? Only this group would remember this. Not in the main. They had no idea what I was talking about. We're so glad you are here. Let's see, we have a guest, Kathy. Where is Kathy? Right here, Kathy is visiting. Guest here, give her a hand. Any other guests that we need to say hi to? Okay. Um, Let me run through, well, first, our snacks. Thank you for all of you that have donated. So the snack donations provided snacks. Give them a hand, all you guys that donate. Thank you for doing that. That really helps. Okay, a number of announcements for you before we head on in. Today, after the second service, um, there will be a debrief right here um, with Albania, the short-term mission trip, as well as Romania, their short-term mission trip. They're going to combine those, and so it'll be right after the end of the second service. If you'd like to come over here I don't know if they have lunch. I'm not sure. Does anyone know? A light lunch. Okay, that you get like two chips or something maybe. I, I don't know. I don't know. Okay, all right. I, I, eat something before you come here. No. Okay, so <clears throat> Albania and Romania will be here. Uh, debrief. And the, it's always wonderful for that. Um, Jim, where is Jim? Jim brought us a handout that is over there. It is your guide to better balance. Right, Jim? Jim, anything you want to say about it? I just want to say that as we age, we have more and more balance problems. And many of us, as you know, have tendon falls. So hopefully this can help you. Very good. Very good. Um, Jim said we're all getting older. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And so... uh, (laughs) <laughs> this is great. Your guide to better balance. There are copies of that over on the tables there. So I wanted to mention that. Um, next Sunday, right here after the second service, is our we'll have our newcomers lunch. So this is where we invite folks who are new or newer to our church, and you want to get kind of a quick overview of who we are. Um, I get to host it. It's always a privilege. And we will have Matt here, our senior pastor, Steve, our executive pastor. Uh, Usually we have, well, we always do children represented and then maybe one or two other staff people so that you can get kind of an overall feel of our church. Um, And then the part, and we have sandwiches, we'll have some homemade desserts for you. And then after we're done, we only go about 30 to 40 minutes. It's not long, purposefully. Because we want to have opportunity, if you have questions for any of us individually, this is always a great time when we finish that you can come chat with us. Love to talk with any of you. So, if you know of anyone, or maybe you're newer, please come by uh, next Sunday after uh, the second service. We will be, as a church, starting to gear up towards small groups they'll be starting we'll have community groups women's groups men just kind of ongoing but uh they'll also 
be going. Uh, there will be a ministry fair coming up on that. You will hear about that very soon. So when you hear that, um, that'll be a great opportunity to look at the other ministries here at this church and how you can connect with them. Um, finally, on Tuesday, August 27th, there here at the church, I believe in the main, there is a ICM banquet, International Christian Ministry. Uh, Dave Champness is our uh, president there. He speaks, and what that ministry does is primarily focuses on equipping and training leaders in Africa as well as into the Middle East, but primarily in Africa. So that banquet is on Tuesday, August 27th in the evening. If you would like to go to that, you can purchase tickets online. So um, that's another one that's available for you. So a lot going on in uh, August. Do you all have any other announcements before we move on? And before I move on, uh, are you all in a good mood? Yeah. Okay, good. All right, wow. That always helps. Okay. Let's go to our hymns. Let's go to our hymns. Two wonderful, wonderful hymns. One with a very brief story, one with a little bit longer. We're going to start with the hymn, At Calvary. Um, based on Romans 5, 8, it says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I've told this story before. I like to tell it. It's, it's just a great story. Dr. R.A. Torrey is the president of the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. He gets a letter from a dad, and the dad says, my kid is a mess. Can he come, <laughs> can he come, to, can he come to Moody Bible Institute? And Dr. Torrey writes him back and says, well, um, I'm sorry that that's occurring, but um, we, we can't admit him. We're a Bible school. We're not a reformatory. <laughs> the man writes back again. He goes, please, would you please consider my son? And so Dr. Tory agrees, provided that the boy meets with him daily and he abides by the rules. The arrangement does not go well at first, does not go well. But over time, um, the boy seems to really start to be uh, more in tune with everything. He is uh, very serious about what's been going on. And he's really responding to Dr. Tory. Now, to make a long story short, several years later, this boy becomes, Will, he is William Newell, and he becomes a very long-term professor at Moody Bible Institute. In 1895, he's thinking about uh, putting his testimony into a verse form, and so he writes a few notes down, okay? He, he gets these done as he's, he actually finishes it as he's walking towards a lecture. He crosses paths with a Dr. Daniel Towner, who is the director of music at Moody. And as they pass, he's going to the lecture, he's going the other way. He says, hey, I've got these uh, words here. Um, can, you put an, uh, can you put a nice little tune to it? And so um, Dr. Towner takes the, the words he, uh, the other guy, uh, uh, Newell, goes for the lecture. The lecture ends. They meet again. He goes, here, I've got the tune. He, j he got this tune in like within an hour of getting the words. Um, and so the two men sing it together, and it, uh, it is what we have today at Calvary. And Newell said, if he had not gone through his troubled years... He might never have fully understood the importance of grace. And that's, that's great. That's a, just a great testimony. So here we go. Let's sing at Calvary. Okay, Marilyn. Years I spent in vanity and pride.
Beautiful hymn. Our other hymn is At the Cross, and this is a very popular hymn, and it was written by Isaac Watts. He was born in 1674. He died in 1748. He became a pastor. He wrote poems. He wrote hymns to go with his sermons. He wrote over 600 hymns. We know him because every Christmas we sing his hymn, Joy to the World. Um, we do not know the story that inspired this song, but we do know how it impacted uh, one particular person. That's Fanny Crosby, who is probably the most prolific hymn writer that has ever been that we've had. She attended a revival meeting, the story goes, in 1851. The congregation sang this song during the altar call. And she was so moved by the song, the words, the sermon that she heard previously. She says, there, Lord, I gave myself away. And she said she was a changed woman. And from that point, um, Crosby wrote over 8,000 hymns, 8,000 hymns, such as uh, Blessed Assurance, among many. Um, so it was this hymn that inspired Fanny Crosby. And I'm sure it inspires others throughout the years. So let's sing At the Cross. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Drove away, and it was there by grace I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Amen, amen. Give Marilyn a hand for helping us out. Thank you. Eunice Carter passed away? Yeah. Oh, my. Yeah. Yes. So, I mean, they go back to the Yeah. Those of you that know uh, Eunice, yes, she goes back to, did you say the 50s, 60s? I, we met her in the 50s. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for sharing that. Eunice Carter passed away. We went to be with the Lord. Yeah. 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 Her age? Did it say her age? Ninety-three. Ninety-three, yeah. Well, it's a time of the first Sunday of each month. River Lakes uh, takes the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is one of two ordinances of the church. The other is baptism. 
The Lord's Supper is taken by those who profess faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We are told to observe the Lord's Supper repeatedly. Uh, we are to remember. It is a sign of fellowship with Christ. It is a reminder of what he did through his sacrificial death on the cross. And that's key because without the cross, there is no Christianity. Now, so what happened? At the Last Supper, Jesus explains he is the true Passover lamb. So that evening when they took it, rather than looking back as you would to God's past acts of deliverance from e while they were in Egypt, Jesus turns his disciples' attention to the future salvation they are going to have through his death and resurrection. The bread and the cup that we are going to take signify what the original Passover lambs had themselves pointed to. They pointed to Christ, who is our Passover lamb. His body is going to be broken. His blood shed it is for you and for me. And this simple act of taking the bread and the juice, it reminds us of Christ's death in our place. And this is why the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 says that often as you take it, we are to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. He also talks about a time of reflection before you take that. And there's a number of reasons for that. I'll just give a couple. One is our focus can be all over. Even though we're here, our focus can be on other things. Things you got to do, things that are troubling you, whatever it might be. So this is a good time. We're going to have just a time of quietness where you can just really focus on the Lord, what he did for us. This could be a time where you just personally are thanking him for that. It also is if you have any, um, I call it unconfessed sin, because that would separate you. You just confess that during this quiet time, um, if, if need be. But um, let's do that. Let's just spend 30, 45 seconds just bowing our heads in quiet, and then we'll take the elements. Before you do that, does everyone have one of these? Is anyone needing? So we're all, we all got it. So let's bow our heads and just reflect, focus on the Lord, thank him. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, he said, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take the juice. Let's pray. 
Lord, I just come before you just as thanksgiving um, for us taking the bread and the cup. Uh, it's just it's over, overwhelming with gratefulness for your love, for your sacrifice for all of us. You desire to have a relationship with us. It was so great that you made a way for us to be with you. Thank you for that. Thank you for your love for us, which surpasses anything I could ever understand or comprehend. Thank you for enduring the pain and the humiliation of the cross in my place and in everyone's place here and declaring us righteous before the Father, undeserving as we all are. We don't deserve your grace but you have extended it to us freely, and we just thank you for that. We ask all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, we're in Acts, but before we go to Acts, those of you that are newer, we have some rules here in this group. One of the rules is you got to have a joke. And let's just be clear. These little one-liner jokes, unacceptable. <laughs> this group demands quality. And quality you get once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> so, this joke is entitled, Lone Ranger and Tonto Go Camping. The Lone Ranger and Tonto Go Camping. And here it is. <laughs> It's so bad. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. The, the, the Lone Ranger and Tano go camping in the desert. After their tent is all set up, they fall sound asleep. A few hours later, Tano wakes up, and he wakes up the Lone Ranger, and he says, Kimosabi, look towards sky. What you see? The Lone Ranger replies, I see millions of stars. What that tell you? Asked Tonto. The Lone Ranger ponders for a minute and he says, well, astronomically speaking, it tells me there are millions of galaxies and potentially millions of planets. Astrologically, it tells me that Saturn is in Leo. Time-wise, it appears to be approximately a quarter past three in the morning. Theologically, it, it's evident the Lord is all-powerful. We are small. We are insignificant. And meteorologically, it seems that we're going to have a beautiful day tomorrow. What does it tell you, Tonto? <laughs> Tonto is silent for a moment. And then he says, it tells me Kimosabi is a moron. Someone stole our tent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, gosh. Oh, boy. <laughs> All right. Every one of us makes decisions. Some of these decisions are simple. What shall I wear today? What shall I eat today? Simple things. Other decisions we make are more complex. Health decisions, financial decisions, moving or staying decisions, things like that. Now, all of us want God's will in making those decisions. But I think we often make it more difficult than it really is. And yet God wants us to know his will in important decisions in your life. And he provides guidance. He does that through the word of God. He does that through the Holy Spirit. Now, as we begin our passage this morning, there is a big decision that needs to be made. The 11 apostles need to know who's going to fill the 12th position that's vacant because Judas has killed himself. Now, the way they approach this decision is important for a couple of reasons. One, it's going to have a huge impact on the future of Christ's kingdom. Two, it's a model. We're going to see kind of a model for the way his followers look at big decisions. And they complement each other. In other words, finding God's will in decision-making, and by doing that, you will be advancing Christ's kingdom. <clears throat> now, I'm going to spend more time in a little bit about how do you know 
And how can you find God's will in your life? But first, let's dive into our story. We are in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 12. Now, Jesus has just ascended or lifted off physically and, and went to heaven. The apostles, while they're gazing upward, you have two angels appear, and they tell them that just as Christ has risen up to heaven, so he's going to return in the same way. And this is where our story begins. Verse 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. Okay, first off, what is a Sabbath day journey? Why is there a Sabbath day journey? Well, okay, that is the distance that the Jewish rabbis determined you could travel during the Sabbath. And it was about anywhere from a half to three quarters of a mile. Now, work was not okay during the Sabbath. So that distance is the farthest you could go, <clears throat> excuse me, on that day and not be considered work. Now, does any of that make any sense whatsoever? No, it doesn't. It was another Jewish man-made rule. Now, where did they go? So forth. I have on your table, there's two, map, uh, two copies of this handy-dandy color map. So if you can take a look at that. To give you an idea, I want to give you a reference point on what they're doing. Where are these guys going right now? They're getting ready to receive the Holy Spirit, but not yet. Okay, I've highlighted, and this is really Jerusalem, and I've highlighted two things in yellow. Mount of Olives, that's where Christ ascends. So there's where they were. And now they're going to return to the upper room. If you'll notice at the bottom left, it says upper room, where the last supper. So I need you that just to give you a reference point. The third reference point is the temple. And that's got the red stripes around it. Okay? And, and hang on to that map just for a minute because it's important to just get, I want you to just get an idea of what they're doing. Okay, verse 13, it says, And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Okay, let me stop there. The scholars say there's potentially two, maybe three possibilities of what upper room they went to. The majority of them believe that they went to where Jesus shared his last supper. And that's what I have highlighted there. Okay, that's one possibility. A second possibility is there was an upper room that was used after Jesus' crucifixion where the disciples met. Or it could be some other third possibility of just another upper room. There is no definite answer, although the majority of the scholars feel it was the Last Supper upper room. We know a lot of the houses back then had those. They had upper rooms. This one had to have been large because we're going to soon read there were 120 people there. Now, what's going on with the apostles at this time? I'm speculating there's this whole mixture of emotions going on as they are going from where Christ ascended back to the upper room. I'm sure there was things like they were quiet, they were subdued, they're really thinking over, they're processing what had just happened, so they probably had some uncertainty, anxiety, fear. Then I think they also knew it was very, very good, but they're not sure what it all meant. We know they did not hunker down. They didn't go to this upper room and just like homestead forever, and we know that because in Luke 25, 53, it says they were continually in the temple praising God. That's after Jesus' ascension. Again, if you reference the map, that red striped area right in the middle. So they're kind of going from 
the lower left to the temple and back. So they are not hunkered down. They are, they are going back and forth. Okay, let's continue with verse 13 and 14. Who's all there? We get a list. Here they are. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. So, <clears throat> those in attendance, you, you had the 11 apostles, you had Jesus' own mother, Mary. This is the last time in scripture that she is mentioned. You had Jesus' half-brothers. We know their names. Their names were James, Joseph, Judas, referred to as Jude. He wrote the epistle of Jude. And Simon. You have those four guys. That says a lot that they are there. Because they now believe that their half-brother Jesus is the Son of God. If you go back to Mark chapter 3, early in Jesus' ministry, they gave Jesus a lot of grief, basically saying, hey, you're out of your mind. Okay? They now believe. It says there, you'll notice it, it just says, the women were there. Scholars are confident that it includes these names. Mary Magdalene was there. You had Mary, the wife of Clopas. Uh, she was important because if you go back to the Gospels, she was there and saw the crucifixion. She brought spices for Jesus' body after his death. Clopas, who's that guy? He was one of the guys, uh, guys on the road to Emmaus that Jesus interacted with. You've got Mary and Martha there. Martha, surely, in the kitchen. She's always in the kitchen, right? <laughs> and then you have uh, probably Salome, Sol Salome the mother of James and John, and you probably had a number of other women there. Now, they stayed together because they believed that the Holy Spirit was going to come upon them, and they are going to receive power as promised. They had absolutely no doubt. And so what do they do? They devoted themselves to prayer. That means they were focused and they were committed in prayer. Now, it says they were in one accord. That means they were uni unified. And when you look at this who's who that are, that are there, you've got to shake your head a little bit about it. You have, um, you have these 11 strong-willed guys who not too long ago, you had a couple of them arguing about who's going to have the best seat in the kingdom. You had another one that denied Christ three times. You had another one that doubted his resurrection. And now they are all unified. As I said, you have Jesus' four half-brothers. They bagged on him previously. They are now unified. You had the women there. Now, these women came from all different social classes. They're now unified. You say, well, how, how could that be? It's because they were all one heart and one mind. They're all looking up to Christ at the same time. For the same thing. Now it says they were praying. What are they praying about? You would think they would be praying. For the coming baptism of the Holy Spirit. They had not been told to pray for that. They were told to wait for it to occur. So they knew it was coming soon. I believe they were praying. Because they were now physically separated from Jesus. And prayer was the only way to communicate with him. Now, what's going to occur is that because of their devotion to prayer, the Lord's going to begin to work through them, and he's going to build his church. So, what have we already seen? We've already seen how these people respond to the resurrected Christ. It's the same issue today. How do we respond to the resurrected Christ? Because that's going to determine how we live. It's going to determine how we're going to spend eternity. And when you look at this, you see how the gospel changes lives. 
Again, I go back to the half-brothers of Jesus. Um, they went from unbelief to belief. So what I'm saying is the gospel can literally change anyone. So don't dismiss those that you know who seem so far lost that they're beyond God's grace. They aren't because God can do all things. So continue to pray for them. And finally, you see this unity in the church, and they're united in prayer, just as we should be. So that should be something we here at River Lakes be a praying church. May that be the case in all churches. Okay? Now, we're given those names, but they weren't the only ones there. So let's continue. Verse 15. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120. Okay, let me stop there. I don't want to whiz on by this because it's an important part here. Have you ever wondered why 120 people are there? Luke is very specific. He doesn't say there's a bunch of people there, a large number. He didn't say there was 80 people there, 60 people there, 90 people. He said 120. He's very specific about that. Here's why. Back then, 120 is the exact number of people required by Jewish law for a council in any city. You say, ah, what does that mean? That means they're about to select the 12th apostle, Matthias. And that number of those being there, 120, that makes it official. That makes it legal. That's why they had 120 people there. And these 120, I call them common folks, they are going to be the nucleus for a movement that is going to change the world. Peter. Peter now asserts himself. No surprise there. He stands up. He reminds everyone in the Old Testament, he's going to quote Psalm 69.25, and then he's going to quote Psalm 109.8 that says they ha that, that has predicted the fate of Judas. And he is going to give us a rather graphic description of how Judas died. So let's read about it. Verses 16 through 20. Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness and falling headlong he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language, Ekeldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, May his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it. And let another take his office. Okay, let's summarize again what happened to Judas. So we know from this passage and likewise passages in Matthew and Luke, you all know the story. Judas betrays Christ. He has regret. He has remorse for what he did. He did not ask for forgiveness. He throws his payment of 30 pieces of silver onto the temple floor. He then leaves. He hangs himself. No one found the body until it had decayed, became bloated, and then his body fell from the noose, lands on the ground face down, his body burst open, and his internal organs spilled out. In ancient times, this way of dying was considered the most shameful way to die because in the Jewish mind, a hanged man was cursed of God. And if the corpse was not buried on the same day, the land would be considered defiled. That's why 
the priests took the money that, that Judas had returned and they bought this field because to them it was blood money. They could not keep it. This field became a cemetery for the unclean. And this place apparently was known throughout Jerusalem as the field of blood. It's like I'm watching a Vincent Price, Peter Cushing, Christopher Lee horror film from the 70s, okay? I mean, that's when I read this, it's, it's that bad, yeah. What's that? Um, I don't know if it's on that map or not. I don't th think it is. You guys can look at If you find it, yell something out, okay? Yeah. So, that was what happened to Judas. Okay, we, now, very important. We now go to verses 21 and 22. Peter is going to give two criteria for the selection of the 12th apostle. So let's read what that criteria is. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John, until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. Okay, so after Jesus betrayed, Judas betrayed Jesus, the 11 remaining apostles, they plan to designate a new apostle in his place. And they look, as they should, to God for guidance. They use the Old Testament system of casting lots, but they had specific criteria. Okay, now what do I mean? Only certain individuals could be considered as a potential apostle. An apostle, by definition, must have witnessed the resurrected Christ and was around since Jesus' baptism by John the Baptist. Now, why do you have to have those two criteria? Good reason. Good reason, because the primary way of teaching and leading these new followers of Christ are going to be verbally and personally, one-on-one. -on -one. Again, there is no New Testament. That's not for a number of years. They have old scriptures on that, but not the New, new Testament. And so the main source for the church for theological truth for these next few decades are going to be these 12. And then they are going to train others. It was the apostles. So these men, these men had all been trained by the Lord, had been among him. You have these apostles are the first messengers of the gospel after the death and resurrection of Christ. These 12 men, they were the foundation of the church. Jesus is the cornerstone. This is the specific type. And this specific type of apostle is not present in the church today. Now, get a question always goes, well, why can't they just go with 11? What's, what's so big about 12? It's because Jesus said in Matthew 19, 28, he says, In the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So the number here is 12. Now, how does that process actually look? Let's read about that. Verses 23 through 26. And they put forth two. They put forward two. Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justus, and Matthias, and they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in the ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So the apostles proposed these two guys who met the criteria. Now, nothing is known about either man. They appear nowhere else in Scripture. Apostles pray, they cast lots, and then Matthias is chosen. <clears throat> this is the last time the casting of lots is done in Scripture. 
And the reason for that is because the coming Holy Spirit is going to make doing that unnecessary. They will seek the Holy Spirit's guidance. We do know that Matthias' name means gift of God. And so he was a gift to the apostles. He was a gift to the church. Now, before I go on, go back to verse 25. It says, I'll go do this slowly, to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. Okay, that phrase, to go to his own place, that is like so sobering because that means hell. It means Judas and others who go to hell belong there. It is their place. It is their choosing. Very sobering. Now, we read about this example of God leading the 11 apostles and choosing Matthias. Now you say, what about today? How do you know God's will for yourself in a situation or a decision that needs to be made? Okay, I want to spend just a couple of minutes on that. First, God wants you to know his will. That's one reason why he's given us his word, the Bible. The Bible gives us God's what I call general will for us. So in any given situation that you have, the first thing to do is determine if the Bible addresses that issue either specifically or in principle. If so, then you have God's will in that matter. And God's never going to lead us to do something that is contrary to his word. So the first thing is you seek his word. Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So we're never going to go wrong by consulting scripture. But I just get, be sure to pay attention to the context of that. Second, God leads us through his, to his will by the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Let me read to you what Paul said in Philippians 2. He said this. He's, he's talking to the church there. He goes, Dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you. And now that I'm away, it's even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation. Obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. So did you catch that phrase? God is working in you. Okay, that's the Holy Spirit. And I would call it the inner prompting of the Holy Spirit. It gives a sense of God's leading. And that leading will guide you in the right way. Okay, third. God leads us through the counsel of wise, qualified, trustworthy people. You all know of people who you feel are mature enough, wise enough, say old enough to listen and give impartial counsel. These people that do that should only want for you what God wants for you. Okay, so seeking uh, other people. So the Bible, Holy Spirit, seeking other people. And then finally, a fourth one, I think God leads you into his will by giving you an inner comfort or peace. Paul said, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Um, for me personally, I've looked back at decisions Felicia and I have made, and it was an inner assurance that really helped us with those decisions. And often uh, there was an assurance, even though you had all these obstacles in front of you. It, it's almost like God saying, hey, I'm in this decision. Trust me through it. So doing God's will, that requires a decision. And that decision requires faith and action. So God's will, seeking that in your life. Well, I have just enough time to introduce chapter 2. I want to read the first 13 verses. And then next week, I'm going to go back to that passage. And we're going to spend a lot of time in that. But I want to get you all excited with chapter 2 because it's wonderful. Here we go. So follow along with me. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. 
and divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together. And they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others mocking. They are filled with new wine. Okay. I'm going to spend most of next week talking about this specific passage, but let me just close this way. The book of Acts is about transition. Okay, I want you to just get overall. And boy, oh boy, do we have transition here. <laughs> okay, let me give you a quick comparison already. What, already what's going to happen. You have chapter 1. The apostles are waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Chapter 2, Holy Spirit arrives. You have chapter 1, the apostles are going to be equipped. Chapter 2, they're going to be empowered. You have in chapter 1, they're held back. Chapter 2, they are sent forth. You have in chapter 1, where Jesus Christ ascends. Chapter 2, Holy Spirit descends. Now, nothing like this event had ever occurred, ever. And if you weren't in that upper room, you would, have have, you would have a very hard time believing it. And if you were one of the people in that upper room who experienced this, you would have had a really hard time explaining what you saw, what you heard, what you felt. This was an absolute supernatural event. And this event marks the beginning of the church. The church is the body of Christ, and he is the head of the church. And this passage describes the birth of the church by the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And again, next week, we look closely at this passage, and I want to try to answer some questions. Here they are, just a few of them. What is the Holy Spirit? How does the Holy Spirit come upon those in the upper room? What exactly happened? How does the Holy Spirit come upon us today? And what is the purpose of the Holy Spirit in our lives? So we'll answer those uh, next week. I just go through this. We're so blessed, aren't we? Oh my gosh, yeah. Let me close. Psalm 113, 2 and 3. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its going down, the Lord's name is to be praised. Amen. Let me pray. Thank you, Father. We are so blessed to have you. Just thank you for the opportunity to remember you and what you did on the cross for us. And I am 100% undeserving of it. But you love me so much and everyone here that you died for us, for our sins, so that we would be viewed as righteous before the Father. Just thank you for that. May we never, never, never forget that. May we remember it constantly. And may we thank you about this always. Thank you as we just look at these events to the beginning of the church. And uh, these are our brothers and sisters in Christ. These are not just people in the Bible and Bible characters. These are our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And it is encouraging to me and I'm sure encouraging to everyone here that you are the same God and the power that you have given that you have given us through your Holy Spirit that is indwelt in us when we accept you as Lord and Savior. Thank you for all of that. Please bless these men and women. Use them throughout the week. We ask all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Hey, thank you all.